the clear light of day, the last part of our story, and we left Esme fast asleep in bed in Jabez's cottage when she stayed the night there. When Esme awoke from a deep and peaceful sleep, she felt completely disoriented for a minute to find herself in an unfamiliar bed. The room had filled with the clear light of day and through the window, which Jabez kept ajar, poured the glory of a blackbird's song. As the night's events reassembled themselves in her consciousness, Esme wondered about what lay ahead. She supposed that a properly responsible woman would have viewed the future with misgiving. But any such qualms were lost in the beautiful peace she felt, lying in the homely simplicity of Jabez's bedroom washed in spring sunshine. Aware of the distant household sounds of someone riddling the ashes in the kitchen stove, and of the absolute security of the cocoon of love she felt around her. She stretched her body luxuriously in the bed and yawned. And then presently she got up and picked up her clothes discarded on the floor, dressed herself and went down to find Jabez and Ember. Slept well? asked Ember innocently. Jabez has gone out to the shed for some kindling. We'll add the kettle on any time soon. Where's your car, Esme? asked Jabez as he came in with his arms full of wood. Oh, I, I left it just off the road in the lane, Esme explained. Ember thought it would be tricky to turn around again in the yard. Jabez didn't answer her at once. He slipped the logs into the basket and dropped the kindling wood in his hand onto the floor in front of the stove. Ember busied herself with getting together breakfast crockery. Atmosphere? exclaimed Esme. Now what's wrong? Jabez squatted before the stove and poked in various twists of paper and torn card, striking a match to set light to these before slowly adding the kindling as the flames took hold. Two things, he said. Two things that Ember knows. First, is that every car has a reverse gear and is well able to get out the same way it got in. Second, is that Wiles Green gets up early and if your car was in my lane at first light this morning, all the village will know it by midday, not sparing the chapel. Ember, you really have surpassed yourself. I hardly know what to say to you. Ember took the jar of oats and the salt cellar off the shelf in readiness for making porridge. You just have to make an honest woman of her then, won't you? She replied, undented. Yes, I see what your intention was. Jabez glared at her over his shoulder, really annoyed. But I just think you should mind your own business for five minutes. Ember ignored this remark, but Esme smiled happily. I think it would be all right, Jabez. Diplomacy and subterfuge come easily to ministers. It's the only way to come through the job alive. Let's say a pastoral visit, you know? You weren't well. Didn't Ember walk all the way to South Harbour to find me? 
Surely that must have been a pastoral emergency. Anyway, I thought you wanted to marry me. That seemed to be what you were saying last night. Ember leaned past him to get the kettle from the hot plate and took it to the sink to fill, all without a word. But Esme could see the mischievous grin on her face as she carried the water back and set it on the stove. Jabez continued slowly to feed the firebox with wood, blowing gently on its contents. I did hear you, he said after a while, but I expect you'll be wanting a cup of tea as well as an answer. Having satisfied himself it was well alight, he fitted in a small log and closed the door adjusting the draught to get it burning briskly. He stood up and wiped the soot and wood ash from his hands onto his trousers. He turned around in the small kitchen and contemplated her. The evasion, the quick glances, the wild creature hiding had all gone. His eyes looking down at her were purely happy. I can't think why you would want me, he said. I am nothing, and I got nothing, and that's how it's likely to stay. But I do like to go about things properly. If you and me are going to be together, then it's going to be for real. And he went down on one knee before her, and took her hand in his. Esme, I'm yours if you want me. Will you marry me? Oh yes, said Esme, wondering how much joy the human spirit could contain. Oh yes, the details we can work out later. On both knees then, he drew her close to him and touched his lips to hers. I'd like to kiss you properly too, he said, but not while we've got an audience. That's private. Private? Ha! Ember opened the tea caddy and ladled two spoons of tea leaves into the pot. If you've been let to keep your private life private, you wouldn't have one at all, Jabez Ferrell. I reckon I deserve to be a witness to that. She regarded them with shining, inscrutable eyes. And I'm very happy for you both. Except I think you took a devil of a long time about it. Hang back. I've never seen a man like it, so help me I have not. We'll get the milk in then, for I don't suppose you have. On the shingle beach at South Harbour, Esme found a spot where the banked pebbles and the wooden groin, green with weed, made a shelter against the sharp spring wind that cut so cold. Sitting there, no one and nothing between herself and the meeting of the supple ocean with the wide grey sky, she allowed the thoughts to come. There would be no future then, such as she had planned, no career. There would be the satisfaction neither of success nor of admiration. Her friends and acquaintances most of all her family, would have come to see the solid, respectable, unimaginative amplitude of the suburban manse, unwitting temple of complacency, and they would have been impressed. Should she, against her better judgment, allow them to see her in the setting of Jabez Ferrell's cottage, 
they would most likely think she had taken leave of her senses. And then, how could they visit her there without meeting Jabez and, even more to the point, Ember? Esme brooded on this. She couldn't get as far as visualising her family's reaction. It was impossible to imagine introducing Ember to them at all. Her movement from full-time itinerant ministry to the precarious territory of local appointment, an honorarium or a half stipend at best, filling gaps in colleagues' absences, gleaning unwanted funerals and helping out with weddings. It would draw puzzled pity, questions, along with the inevitable inability of modern people to understand Jabez and his sense of home. It would be impossible to explain that he would expect to live with his wife and live with her in his own cottage, and that was just how it was. A way of being that had no dialogue with contemporary employment structures. In today's world, a professional woman with savvy tended her career, watched her back and saw to her pension. If Esme chose Jabez, she would grow old into grinding poverty, torn at times, no doubt, between the necessity to earn a living and being there to care for Ember and Jabez as the frailties of old age began to make themselves felt. She wondered, what have I done? But at the same time, registered with mild surprise, her lack of dread or regret or apprehension. Her place in the institution of the church, with its bureaucracy and liturgy and petty feuds, failed to fix her attention. Without noticing the shift, as she looked out over the patient tides of the ocean waves, her mind drifted and she began to think about silver. Silver had been tarnished in the narrow world of tradition that shuts out life, reduced to 30 coins that betrayed a man to death. But even silver, the currency of human greed, had kept its beauty if she remembered to open her vision to the living earth. The silver of the clouds in this overcast day, underlit by a barred wash of rose as afternoon drew toward evening. The muscular rippling of the sea reflecting the brightness of the sky like pewter, silvery bright along the paths of the light. The silver, clear light of day, not the squinting glare of cloudless midsummer, but this cool and lucid dove light. She thought of Jabez's hair, as the sunlight caught it, the faintest suggestion of auburn warming its stranded silver fall. Youth's last illusion. Jabez, the look in his eyes, observant, perceptive, shy sometimes, bright glances other times. Fleetingly, in the midnight garden, the utter longing of his love. Warm in laughter, the downward gaze of controlled annoyance 
when ember needled him to exasperation. Quiet gaze, intelligent, focused on a piece of machinery. Shafts she had glimpsed, steep drops to remembered pain, dizzy, acute, frightening. Jabez. His eyes dark and deep in the shadow and moonlight, drawing her to himself, gentle. She'd made her choice and there were no regrets. Jabez had little or nothing to offer her but himself and the willingness to share with her everything he had. To take this path, considered prosaically, was to embrace poverty and insecurity. But Jabez, with his humble trust in the power of simplicity, gave her an obscure sense of safety, as though his cottage, hedged about with its fragrant herbs and ancient apple trees, was a sanctuary where she could be absolutely safe. The place, she realised, where she had at last found peace. And she knew that she wanted to be there with him more than anything. Having found her way there, if she could believe in the goodness of life enough to stay, it would be a shelter and a resting place. Friendship, honesty, belonging, a fireside, a home, simplicity and space. Having found her way there, it was too precious to let go. She had made her choice as, in the unfolding months of deepening friendship, she had let all that it meant lodge inside her and become a deep, upwelling, crystal source of hope. It was like a church to her, like the little church she had glimpsed in a field from the train so long ago, a place of refuge, a way of life offering space to be and time to think. A chance to feel with her fingers the dusty hem of Christ's homespun robe and find the daily walking meditation of the barefoot way of prayer. And that's the end of our story. I do hope you've enjoyed it. It's been nice spending this time with you. Thank you for making the journey with me. Thank you for listening to the story. Now I know I'm not very good at singing, but I wanted to leave you with one more song goes like this. Somebody prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so very glad, I'm so glad they prayed, I'm so glad they prayed for me. My sister prayed for me, had me on her mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so very glad, I'm so glad she prayed, I'm so glad she prayed for me. My brother prayed for me, had me on his mind, took the time to pray for me. 
I'm so very glad, I'm so glad he prayed, I'm so glad he prayed for me. My pastor prayed for me, had me on his mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so very glad, I'm so glad he prayed, I'm so glad he prayed for me. And Jesus prayed for me, had me on his mind, took the time to pray for me. I'm so very glad, I'm so glad he prayed, I'm so glad he prayed for me. Heavenly Father, thank you for the times we've spent together and the prayers we've prayed. Thank you that in hearing the story and sharing our thoughts, we have consciously entered your presence, consciously touched your love, which is always there with us, your kindness, which circles around us and carries us home. Father, we commend our way to you. We ask that you will never leave us. We ask that our faith may not fail, but may we may walk with you to the journey's end. And we give you thanks that you sent Jesus to open for us the new and living way so that we could come home to heaven. Amen. Peace be with you then. Go well. May you be happy. May you be contented. May you be tranquil in your spirit. May you be free.